Nowhere in the world is completely safe when there's an epidemic raging. We begin tonight with a nation already on edge in the coronavirus pandemic as protests turn violent across America. Pope Francis used his first Easter Sunday address to call for world peace. Si, Cristo è la nostra pace. The U.S. lost more than 20 million jobs just in the month of April, making it the worst jobs report on record. The Word of God gives hope to a world in chaos. It provides the answers we're looking for regarding our future. The final chapter of Bible Prophecy, a multi-presentation series of hope during Earth's closing hours. to the next presentation for the final chapter of Bible prophecy. You may or may not have some questions already. Well, we want to give time for Bible question and answers. If you haven't done that yet, go to beholdthesavior.com. You can download free Bible study guides, and there's one for each one of our presentations. You know, during these uh, presentations, you're getting a lot of information, bam, 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 left and right, and sometimes it can kind of feel like you're drinking from a fire hydrant. So it's good that you can go back and rewatch this series, and you can follow the notes along and, and help things to digest and make sense uh, for it as well. We've got a big subject in store tonight, so we're going to jump right in, into it. We're going to talk about the great mystery of death. And, you know, in all things in life, you can ask somebody what something's going to be like. When I was uh, a younger child and I was getting ready to go into high school, I could ask my older brothers that went before me and say, what's it going to be like going into high school? And they would tell me. And then once I get ready to go into the workforce, uh, I could ask those that have gone before me, hey, what's it going to be like working for a living? And then once you get ready to be married, you can ask people that have gone before and you can say, what's it going to like being married? And then they'll say, no, no, don't do it. <laughs> Just joking. It's the best thing that could ever happen to somebody, assuming you're doing it right. But you can't ask somebody, what's it like when you die? Not a whole lot of people have gone there, come back and talk about it. And we're going to see that. There's a story that is known as what I like to call the greatest story never told. Well, don't you mean the greatest story ever told, Brandon? No, I'm talking about the greatest story never told. Let's take a look at some of the greatest stories ever told. Romeo and Juliet, a story of romance, a story of love. Certainly one of the greatest stories that have ever been shown or, or told. How about the story of the Trojan horse? A uh, great story of deception, of battle. And uh, how about the story of Homer's Odyssey? Maybe you've had to read that in high school or college. And certainly it's been gone down through history. It's one of the greatest stories ever told. And you know the greatest story ever told was the story of Jesus. But what about those who never told the story? What about those about death? Who do you go for for answers when it comes to death? Maybe you're in even wondering, is there life after death? What happens when someone dies? Do you go off into the cosmos somewhere? Do you go to hell? Do you go to limbo? Is there some kind of in-between thing? Do they go anywhere at all? Do they go straight to heaven or they go to purgatory? Are we reincarnated? This is one of those things that every single individual on planet Earth will grapple with at some point in their lives, and it's something that really deserves our attention. In the book of Job, Job has a lot to say about this subject. Job says, if a man die, shall he live again? Is there something to hope for after death? 
There was a very, very popular book that was out a number of years ago. It's even been turned into a movie. The book is called Heaven is for Real, a little boy's astounding story of his trip to heaven and back. This was a New York Times bestseller, and this tells us people want to know what happens when we die. Now, it's a good question. We've got to discover where do we go for our answers? Do we look to the novels and to the movies, or do we look to the Word of God for our answer, for our hope? We can find excitement everywhere, but I'm not interested in excitement. I'm interested in the truth. The truth is exciting enough. Today, we're going to ha have death's question answered for you. We want to go to Revelation chapter 1, verse 18. In Revelation, Jesus says, I am he who lives and was dead. Now, we've just been talking about somebody that's gone on ahead of us, and we want to know what it's like. There is one person that you can trust beyond a shadow of a doubt that can give us information of what happens when you die. Jesus says, I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Jesus has the answer, the information that we need. Now, we want to look to his interaction and dealings with death. Jesus had someone close to him that was becoming very, very sick to the point of illness. And this is surrounding the story of Lazarus. Jesus' friends come up to him, hey, Lazarus is not doing well. Well, it's okay. Um, he'll just sleep it off a little bit, and then he'll be okay. He's falling asleep. He said, our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him. And the disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get well. However, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought he was speaking about taking a rest in sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Now, because this is such a heavy subject, I want to handle it as respectfully and give it the, the honor that it deserves, because I'm sure every single one of us have experienced the loss of someone close to us. Jesus does not even remove himself but from experiencing the sting of death. In fact, the shortest verse in the Bible, John chapter 11, verse 35, it says Jesus wept. Jesus knows what it's like to experience tears of the loss of life. So what happens when someone dies? If Jesus himself has felt loss and has suffered death himself, it would be good to go to him for the answers. But you can't understand what happens at the end of life until you understand what happens at the beginning of life. So we're going to have to go all the way back to the book of Genesis, back in the beginning, to find our answer. Let's go to Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. The Bible says... And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Six days God speaks everything into creation, into existence, but on the sixth day he gets his hands dirty, forms Adam out of the dirt, out of the dust of the ground, and then breathes into his nostrils the breath of life, and man becomes a living soul. Did God put a soul into Adam or did he become a living soul? Well, it takes a few elements. It takes the elements of the earth plus the breath of life, the dirt plus the breath of God equals a living creature. You have the dust plus the spirit of God, which equals a living soul, a living being. So really our question is wrapped up into understanding two things. What is the soul and what is the spirit? And what happens to them at creation and at death? Well, we know at the beginning of life, you are a living soul. The Bible says you become a living soul. God breathed into the Adam the breath of life and he became a living soul. Now, let's go to the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7 says, Then the dust will return to the earth, as it was, and the Spirit will return to God who gave it. So what is the Spirit? It seems that what happens at death is the exact opposite of what happened at creation. At creation, the elements of the earth plus the elements of God equals a living soul. 
And at the end, at death, the body goes back to the dirt and the breath, that spirit of life goes back to God. In fact, we find more of our answers in the book of Job. Job 27 verse 3 says, All the while my breath is in me, and the Spirit of God is in my nostrils. Now, this is kind of ancient Hebrew poetry where they say the same thing two different ways. Notice this. All the while the breath is in me, and the Spirit of God is in my nostrils. In fact, in Job 33 verse 4, it says, The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of Almighty gives me life. That breath is the Spirit of God. Breath comes from a Hebrew word ruach. It means air, wind, breath, spirit. In the Greek, it comes from the word pneumo. Think pneumatic drill or think pneumonia. Air, wind, breath, spirit. It all means the same thing. It's probably best understood when we look at the concept of a box. Let's assume I've got uh, four pieces of wood. I've got a hammer and some nails, right? And I grab that hammer and nails and I put it together and what I have is a box, right? Well, it's not a very good one, <laughs> but at least we got a box there. So it took the boards plus the nails to make this box. Now, what happens if I pull the nails out and I separate the box from, uh, the nails from the box and the pieces are all in pieces? What do I have? There's no box, right? Well, where did the box go? It's a good question, isn't it? Did it go up to box heaven, or did it go down to box hell? Or did it simply cease to exist at this point? Let me help you to understand it this way as we talk about a light switch. Now, assuming you've got a good electrical system in your house, you flip the switch, the energy, the electrical current races to the light bulb, it turns on, and what do you have? You have light. Now, what happens if I flip that switch off? It cuts off the electric to the light bulb, and what do I have? Darkness, I have no light. Where did the light go? Did it go up to light heaven or down to light hell? Or did it simply cease to exist at this point? Now, these are really some profound things to think about. Spirit comes from a Hebrew word, ruach. It's used 377 times in the Bible. It's translated 117 times as wind or air, 33 times as spirit, and two, I'm sorry, as breath, 227 times as spirit. So when we think of a soul, we already know, biblically speaking, you are a living soul. Genesis 2, 7, God breathed in the man, the breath of life, he became a living soul. Did you ever go into a room and there's nobody there and you walk out and you say, whew, man, there wasn't a soul in there. It's not that you're talking about ghosts or disembodied spirits. You're saying there wasn't anybody in there. So we know you are a soul. And we also know now the spirit is simply the breath of God. It's that life-giving force that makes you alive. So how does the Bible refer to death? We can refer to it any way we want to, but what's important is how God refers to it in the Bible. We can go back to John chapter 11, and we can see a very, very good understanding of how Jesus explains it. He said, our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. Now, what word did Jesus use to explain death? He used the word sleep. It's a good word. It's a good explanation. So God seems to tell us that death is a dreamless, consciousness sleep. Now, we already know that with the example of the box. When I take it apart, I have no box. But also, I have the power to put that box back together again, right? We've already studied the second coming. We already know that God's putting things back together for us. We know God can give life. But what happens between death and the return of Jesus, the resurrection? What is it like? When Lazarus died, God waited a few days. Jesus waited a few days until he would bring him back to life. And a few days after his death, he said, Lazarus, come forth. He didn't say, Lazarus, come down, didn't say, Lazarus, come up. He said, Lazarus, come forth. And what happened? The voice of the Creator gave life to him once again. 
Now, think about this. If there were somebody today who had been dead and buried for four days and they somehow popped up out of the grave, what would happen? You know every news organization in the world would have a microphone shoved into their face and what would be the first question they would ask? They'd say, what was it like? Where did Lazarus come from? Now, would it have been nice or would it have been cruel to bring Lazarus back from heaven? Think about this. If you're Lazarus, you've died, you've already been sick and you've, you've died, you've lived your, done your time on this earth. You die, you go straight to heaven. You're up there in perfection. You're with God the Father and everything. As we're genu generally taught, you go straight to heaven or straight to hell. Let's assume he went straight to heaven. Now Jesus resurrects. He pulls him out of heaven, and then he puts him back here on earth. Wouldn't that be the most dirty, rotten trick anybody would ever pull? So what was Lazarus doing during that time where he was dead? Well, Acts chapter 7, verses 59 to 60, it says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge him with his sin. Then he had said, when he had said this, he fell asleep. This is de uh, the, the deacon uh, Stephen who was stoned to death. And the Bible says when he died, the Bible calls it asleep. Jesus, when dealing with Lazarus, was confronted with some of his family members. Lord, if you had been here, this would never have happened. How many of us have accused God of those things? And in John chapter 11, verse 23, Jesus says, Your brother shall rise again. And then one closest to Lazarus and Jesus says, I know he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. When did those that were even closest to Jesus expect the resurrection to take place? He expected it to take place at the last day. So what happens between death and the resurrection? What takes place there? What is this sleep like? The Bible calls it sleep, so we might as well go ahead and call it a sleep as well. Let's look at Psalm 146 verse 4. It says, his breath goeth forth, he returns to his earth, in that very day his thoughts perish. So when a person dies, evidently there's no more thinking during that time. His thoughts perish. Well, uh, we have more uh, information on Ecclesiastes 9.5. For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. We know that we are going to suffer death unfortunately on earth. It's the result of sin. It was not God's original plan. That's not what he intended, but this is the effects of sin. We know, shy of the return of Jesus, we will see death. The living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Huh. Neither have they any more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Also their love and their hatred and their envy is now perished. Neither have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. So what's happening during this time between death and resurrection? They're, they don't love anyone. There's nothing going through their mind. Now, you would think if you die, you go straight to heaven. You'd think, well, you'd be surrounded with loved ones. You'd wrap your arms around Jesus or, or something. But the Bible says none of that happens yet. Ecclesiastes 9.10 says, Whatsoever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave where you are going. So the Bible describes it as a sleep. What exactly is this sleep like? Well, how many of you have had babies? Now, if you have babies and it's in the memorable past, <laughs> well, let me share with you my experience with my child. Uh, my, my son, right, he was our experimental baby, as I like to call it. He was the first one. He's the one that taught us how to be parents. And, uh, you know, babies get a little bit cranky. And one of the best things that our son loved to do, he loved to go for car rides. That would just usually knock him right out. Uh, he would go to sleep. So we'd put him in the car ride, and he'd be, you know, acting like a baby. And, 
and we'd be praying, dear Lord, please help him to fall asleep so we can get some sleep. My wife would be in the back seat talking to him, soothing him. And every time we would go under a street light, she tells me she would see these big, bright, wide open eyes. But eventually, he would fall asleep. Now, the last thing he would know would be riding in the car seat in the car. And the next thing he would know would be he's waking up comfortable in his bed, right? But he doesn't know that I've driven the car safely home and I've quietly, gently opened the door, unbuckled the, the seats and everything, lifted him up, carried him, protected him, watched over him, play, took him out of his car seat and gently placed him in bed. The last thing he knew was he was in the car. The very next thing he knew was he's waking up safe, comfy, cozy in his own bed. This is how Jesus describes death. Really, it's the most peaceful thing God could possibly do for us. So let's imagine maybe I'm driving down the street, God forbid the unthinkable happens, and I get hit by a truck. The last thing I know is that's it, lights out. The very next thing I know is waking up safely in the arms of Jesus. When do we go to heaven, though? When do we make it to the arms of Jesus? Peter was preaching one time, and he said some very profound things and gave us a very good understanding of the time that it takes. Acts chapter 2, verse 29, he says, Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. What he's saying here is he's saying here, David, he died something like eight, nine hundred years ago, and his body is still with us to, to this day. Acts chapter 2, verse 34. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he himself said, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand. In other words, Peter is saying, listen, this is what David said. David, David had some information from God, and God said, listen, you're going to be at my right hand one day. But Peter's saying, listen, he died like eight, 900 years ago, and he's still not up in heaven, so where is he? Well, the only thing that makes good sense, biblical sense, is that he's resting in the grave, awaiting the resurrection. Job chapter 14, verse 12. So man lies down and does not rise, till the heavens are no more, they will not awake, nor be roused from their sleep. Job chapter 21 verse 30 says, For the wicked are reserved for the day of doom. They shall be brought out on the day of wrath. So actually the Bible seems to suggest everybody will be resurrected at some point. But what happens between heaven or death and heaven and the final judgment it's that dreamless, conscienceless sleep. Job says, until the heavens are no more, they will be not awakened either. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. I've read this at many, many, many funerals. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren. Right off the bat, right there, did you catch that good news? Paul, he's writing a letter to the church in Thessalonica, and he says, listen, guys, I don't want you to be ignorant. I don't want you to have no hope. I want you to have a good understanding of what takes place at death. I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. He uses that word asleep there. What's it talking about? Talking about death. Do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with a voice of an archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. When does the resurrection take place? When do we get to go to heaven? At the return of Jesus. At death, we, biblically speaking, fall asleep. And then when Jesus comes back, there's the shout, the voice of the archangel, so loud it raises the dead. And what you find there is the greatest reunion in the history of the universe that will ever, 
happen and how would you like to be there ready for that reunion? I can't wait myself. I've had to say goodbye to people. In fact, one of the things that pastors don't particularly like is doing funerals. I mean, it's an honor to be there and to celebrate someone's life and give hope to the family. But uh, it's you see the results of sin. The one thing that gets us through these is hope that it's not always going to be like this. I've done, I was doing a funeral one time, and somebody was talking to me just before I got up to uh, speak at the funeral. They looked at me and said, I don't know how people do this that don't have any hope. This person meant the world to me. The only thing that gets me through this is knowing I get to see them again one day. And when does that happen? When does the resurrection take place? At the return of Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51 says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. Is death a mystery right now? Well, we're kind of we're ha- taking care of some of those mysterious things now, aren't we? But there are some things that we may not quite understand. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Not everybody will die. There will be some that will be alive when Jesus comes back. Notice he uses that word sleep there. When Jesus comes back, it happens in a couple different phases. When Jesus comes back, those who have died, who have given their hearts to Jesus, they are resurrected and caught up into the clouds with him. Then we who are alive and remain are caught up into the clouds with them, and together we all get to go to heaven together. You want to to experience something with your family all at the same time? How about a trip to heaven? Why don't you book that trip now? Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. When does the trumpet happen? At the return of Jesus. When does the resurrection take place? At the return of Jesus. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. And how many of you can say amen to that? So when do we gain our immortality? We gain our immortality at the return of Jesus. We go to heaven at the return of Jesus. Right now we have sin saturated. We have corruptible, corrupted bodies. We're subject to sickness and decay and all of those things. Wrinkles and gray hair and love handles and everything. But when Jesus comes back, everything is restored to us. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we get our perfected, youthful, glorified body. And that is the gift that he gives to us. Eternal life with him, our loved ones, and a perfected body. But you might be thinking, but I thought my loved ones who died went straight to heaven. You know, I thought my mom or grandma, when they passed away, they went to heaven and they're looking down on us. That's what my pastor said. That's what my parents, what I've been told all my life. Now, does it bring more hope, our loved ones looking down on us, or is it actually not what it seems? Think about this for a second. Hear me out now. Let's take Adam and Eve, for example. 6,000-ish years ago, they did the dumbest thing in the history of planet Earth, and they chose to disobey God. And as a result of that, death comes. They were designed to live forever, but they separated themselves from God because they chose sin. And then they eventually die. They go off the scene. But as a result of their sin, cancer enters planet Earth. Sickness enters planet Earth child rape and molestation enter planet earth war disease pandemics all of that is the result of walking against god would it be heaven if adam and eve went straight to heaven and they're looking down on all the devastation that their decision has caused would that be a merciful thing or a cruel thing for god to do jesus does the best, most merciful thing he could do, and allows them to simply rest. No knowledge, the Bible says, until the resurrection. 
So I have not grown up believing these things. This was new to me at one point too. You know, I always thought you die, you go straight to heaven or straight to hell, and that's just the way it is. And it seems that somebody along the line wasn't telling me the truth. But I'm thankful for the Bible that it has the truth for us. Revelation chapter 21, verse 4. God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. This verse is particularly touching to me, and I'll tell you why. First of all, imagine Adam and Eve in heaven watching. They would be pouring tears all the time. It would be heartbreaking. It would be crushing. When my father was in his last days and struggling with cancer, just before he lost his battle with cancer, I took my Bible, and I sat by his bedside, as I have done to, unfortunately, many people throughout the years. And it, all I can do, you know, you sit at the bedside of those that you know are not going to make it. You feel helpless, and you wonder, what in the world can I do? The greatest thing that you can do for them is to deliver the hope that God has given us through his Bible. And I sat at my father's bedside, and I read this to him. I said, God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, Neither shall there be any more pain. There's going to be a time when there's no more tears. There's going to be a time when there's no more pain. All this mess that the devil has inflicted here on planet Earth, it will not be there in heaven. So how could God put us in heaven and watch what's taking place here on planet Earth? Well, but Pastor Brandon, how do you explain seeing dead relatives in dreams? How do you explain people that die, go to heaven, talk about it, meet family members, and then come back and tell the experience? How do you explain these near-death experiences? Well, let's handle one at a time. How do you explain, explain uh, loved ones in dreams? Well, you know, sometimes we have to take dreams for what they are, dreams. There's a lot of hope there. God may even allow us to have peace through a dream. Maybe he'll allow us um, something to know that everything's going to be okay. But how do we explain these people that supposedly died, went to heaven, experienced it, and came back to talk about it? How do we handle these near-death experiences? And before, we're going to handle some specifics here, but again, we've got to make a decision. Do I go with what God says, or do I do, go with what somebody experiences? I'm going to go with what the Bible says, and let's see that here. Let's take a look at some facts regarding near-death experiences. Number one, none of the people who experienced near-death experiences really died. The Bible says when a man dies, he will never come back to his house again. Now, there are some exceptions, those that Jesus resurrected. There have been some resurrections in the Bible. I'll give you that much, but that's the exception, not the rule. For the most part, we die, we rest in the grave. Job says, for the majority, in the most part, the, once we die, we never come back to the house again. So, again, none of the people who experienced near-death experiences really died. They used to think when, some, when the heart stops beating, and then somebody's dead. And sometimes they're able to get that heart going again. Now, did they die and come back? Now they know it's when there's no brain activity. When there's no brain activity, the person is, is deceased. There's no more computer telling the machine what to do by this point, and it is shut down. That's when death takes place. Number two, many near-death experiences resemble hallucinations. I've talked to many, many people. Every time I do this series, somebody shares their testimony with me, their story, and certainly I don't discount that people experience something. And people tell me how they died, they experienced something and came back, and more often than not, usually there's some head trauma involved, or uh, perhaps the brain has been starved of blood and oxygen. And our brains can play tricks on us when we experience those things. Usually the stories are similar when, uh, you know, oh, I saw this bright light. Well, usually if there's a trauma, you're in a hospital room, you're in an emergency room, what usually is above the bed, big bright light. And then some people say, well, I experienced this feeling of floating away from my body. 
And uh, one person told me this, you know, whether it's true or not, you take it for what it is, but usually around the rim of the light, it's so shiny you can see a reflection. Is it possible that the mind is seeing the reflection and twisting things around like you're looking down on yourself? I don't know, but we've got to go with the Bible says anyway. So what do we do? Do we trust what our mind tells us or do we trust what the Word of God tells us? Tell you what, let's take a look at what science tells us. Carbon dioxide and out-of-body experiences. In one experiment, Dr. Ladislas Maduna administered 30% carbon dioxide and 70% oxygen to a subject. Afterward, the subject stated, I felt as though I was looking down at myself. As though I was way out there in space, I felt sort of separated. Lack of blood and oxygen to the brain can play tricks on our bodies. And the big point, I guess, is out-of-body or near-death experiences contradict Scripture. Job chapter 7 verse 9 says, As a cloud vanishes and is gone, so he who goes down to the grave does not return. He will never come to his house again. The Bible is very, very clear on this point. But Pastor Brandon, there's people that tell such convincing stories like this book, Heaven is for Real. How do we explain stories like this? Well, you have to wonder, was the person actually dead? Were people in the room talking about what was happening? I've even read stories of youth who have had near-death experiences, and then other people have convinced them and perpetuated these stories, and uh, they come back and, and, and they say, I did not experience what they told me to say I experienced. Trust the Bible. And those are some good words right there. We need to trust the Bible. What about those in the Bible who did go to heaven? Well, I told you there were a couple exceptions, and we'll take a look at that. How about Enoch, for example? He was the seventh from Adam. The number seven in the Bible seems to represent perfection and completeness. The seventh day Sabbath, the seventh, perfect God's number. Anyway, Enoch, the Bible says that he walked with God and was no more. He walked straight into heaven. Evidently, his relationship was so strong at that moment, God said, come on down. He never did experience death, but was taken straight to heaven. What about Elijah? Elijah was... Um, was walking and talking with his successor, Elisha, and said, if you see me go up to heaven, you'll be blessed with what you're asking. You'll get a double portion of the Holy Spirit. He goes up, his mantle comes down. He watched him taken up into heaven in the fiery chariot. He did not experience death either. And then there's Moses. Moses, the Bible seems to indicate that Moses died and was resurrected. In uh, Jude chapter 1, verse 9, second to last book of the Bible, it says the devil contended for the body of Moses. They were kind of fighting over him, it seems. So two went straight to heaven. One died uh, and went to heaven then. And really the best explanation we can see this with is at the transfiguration on the mount. There was a time during Jesus' ministry where he took a couple of his disciples. He went aside, took them for the special experience, and he was glorified. He was transfigured into his glorified body. And there were two people there with him, Moses and Elijah. And the disciples that were there recognized who it was. Now, there are no pictures back then, remember, right? There's no, there's no Instagram and Facebook and selfies. How did they know it was who it was? Now, well, that's an interesting point. Why Moses? Why Elijah? Jesus, uh, Moses and Elijah were up in heaven on credit. Remember, the only way to heaven is through Jesus. He hadn't died on the cross yet. They're up there. They come back down here to encourage and strengthen Jesus. Not only that, but you have one who died and was resurrected and one who walked straight into heaven. Moses was there to symbolize those that will die and will be resurrected and taken to heaven. Elijah was there to symbolize those that will be taken straight to heaven without experienced death. 
Now, they are the exception more than the rule. Even when Jesus died on the cross, the Bible says that many of the saints which slept arose. The Bible doesn't say what happened after that, but that was a special, unique resurrection. But for the most part, the rule of thumb is, as Job said, when someone dies, they never come back to their house again. Now, this seems to be uncomfortably connected with spiritualism. What does spiritualism teach? Many near-death experience details are frightfully similar to spiritualism teachings. Let me tell you about E.W. Sprague. He's a spiritualist. Spiritualism says the dead know more than the living. Remember, the Bible said the dead know nothing. Spiritualism says the dead know more than the living. Complete contradiction of the Bible. And the serpent said to the woman, ye shall not surely die. In this, as in many other Bible passages, the devil told the truth and the Lord is in error. That's a hard thing to swallow, isn't it? Someone accusing the devil of telling the truth over Jesus? Rewind your mind back to the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve, they were tempted by the serpent, and uh, Eve was the first one to experience this temptation, and the serpent said to her, uh, you will not surely die. The devil says you're not really going to die. But the Bible says that we will experience death. Now, if the Bible says when we die, we die. We sleep um, until the resurrection kind of makes you wonder now those that are praying to other people talking to other saints and, and things that have gone on before us who in the world are they talking to well let's unpack this for a little bit the devil works with deception that's one of the greatest weapons he has he deceived Adam and Eve and as a result, Adam and Eve were ejected from the Garden of Eden. They lost access to the tree of life. Let's talk about Ezekiel 18, verse 4. Ezekiel says, Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. The soul who sins shall die. Of the 858 times the word souls is used uh, it is never linked with immortal. You will never find the word immortal soul in the Bible. The Bible says a soul will die. Remember, what is a soul? You are a soul. God breathed into man the breath of life, and man became a living soul. God says that we will die. So when do we gain immortality? The Bible already told us that at the return of Jesus. Where did all of these other ideas of death come from? Well, let's check with the William E. Gladstone says the pagan doctrine of the immortality of the human soul crept into the back door of the church. I'm sorry to tell you that it came in the same place many of these other unbiblical teachings have come in through pagan Babylonian teaching and it found its way, it wormed its way into the church and unfortunately this uh, information has been taught and regurgitated so many times. You know, you tell a lie long enough, it starts to be taken as truth. 2 Corinthians 11.13 says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. Can the devil pretend to be something he's not? Yeah, well, he's done it with the serpent, right? Is it possible that the devil can even pretend to be our loved ones to pretend that he has, they have come back from the grave? Ooh. Matthew 24, 24. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the very elect. Even the elect. Now, you know who the elect is? It's you and it's me. It's those that are specifically studying the things of the Bible, specifically studying what God has to say. And Jesus is saying, if you're not careful, even you could be deceived. Well, that's why we pray for guidance. We want to be guided by the Holy Spirit as we study. Uh, Revelation chapter 16, verse 14. How do some of these deceptions take place? For they are the spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them 
to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Can the devil perform miracles? Yes. Can the devil even pose as our dead loved ones? You know, the devil, he, he has no conscience, and he will do whatever it takes to deceive us, even manipulating those closest to us. Let's talk about ghosts of Gettysburg and things like that. I used to live not far from Gettysburg, and I would hear about ghost stories all the time, people claiming that they have seen uh, ghost soldiers, and you can even go on ghost walks and supposedly hear the stories or even see some ghosts. Now, wait a second. If the Bible says when you die, you rest in the grave until the resurrection at the return of Jesus, what is it that people are seeing? Is it possible that what they're seeing is not ghosts, but that it is fallen angels posing as humans? I was doing a Bible study one time with a uh, couple, and we were tackling the subject of death, what happens when you die. And this couple was um, very, very excited about what they were hearing. And, you know, usually when we go over this with people, I, I can even almost see the light bulb ding, click on when things make sense. I was talking with this couple, and it clicked. They saw that when we die, we rest in the grave, and we wait to the return of Jesus. That's when the resurrection takes place. This woman, she stood up, burst into tears, ran out of the room, and I felt like a little bit awkward there. I looked at the gentleman that was with her and I said, why don't you go in and check on her? And uh, gave them a couple minutes and she composed herself and she came back out. And I said, listen, I'm really, really sorry if I upset you. That certainly was not my intention. I just want to share with you the hope that God has for us. If you'd like, I can step out and we can meet up again some other time. She says, no, no, don't you dare go anywhere. I got upset because every week I go to my grandfather's grave and I talk to my grandfather there. And now I see what the Bible says and I got terrified because now I'm wondering who have I been talking to all of these years. Let me tell you about another friend of mine. They were uh, doing Bible studies with their neighbor. And they were hearing all of these beautiful, wonderful things that you've been hearing throughout this series. And um, it eventually came out that this neighbor that was learning the Bible had been talking with her mother every single night before bed. Now, that sounds okay if I just left it at that. But the problem is, 20 years ago, this mo woman's mother died. So... Every night for 20 years, this deceased mother had been coming to the foot of the bed and talking with this woman. And once she had learned, it cannot be this woman's mother. It must be a fallen angel. And once she learned the truth about what the Bible says, she never had the experience ever again. Never. There's something about the power of the Word of God, the power of what truth can tell it to. It has the power to dispel evil influences, even when they seem so strong that you cannot do it on your own. Now, the hope that we have is that Jesus, with Jesus, all things are possible. Um, now, what's the big deal about this? Why, why do we need to have such a great understanding about death? One of the devil's final deceptions will be to pose as our dead loved ones. Uh, he will want to pose as Jesus himself. And he will come and he will make it look like he is Jesus. Maybe he'll be floating. Maybe he'll even have a glow around him. He'll have his evil angels pretending to be uh, holy angels. And he may make it look like he's raising dead Bible people back to life to confirm who he is. He may make it look like he's raising our dead loved ones back to life to confirm who he is. But we're going to be able to say, I don't think so. I know what the Bible says on both of these subjects, the return of Jesus and what happens at death. Now, let me ask you this. What about the thief on the cross? Now, when 
Jesus was being crucified. There were two people next to him. One of them was converted, turned and said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, wait a second, Pastor, you just told me that when you die, you rest in the grave until Jesus comes back. Sounds like Jesus was telling this guy that he was going to be with him right then and there in heaven. Where is paradise? He said, I tell you today that you will be with me in paradise. Well, paradise is another name for heaven. Paradise is where the tree of life is. The tree of life is in paradise. It's heaven. Jesus was telling him something that day, but what exactly was he telling him? And our answer is found with Mary. Just three days later, Jesus talked to the thief on the cross on Friday. Jesus died, rested in the grave, even uh, honored the Sabbath, even in death, and was resurrected on Sunday, the first day of the week. Mary comes to him and, uh, and is excited. You know, the, the person that she's been following for three and a half years is back. He's raised back, to, raised back to life, and she wants nothing more than to hold him, hug him, peep him there. But Jesus says to her, do not touch me. In John chapter 20, verse 17, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. So we've got a problem here now. Who did Jesus lie to? Did Jesus lie to the thief? Did Jesus lie to Mary? Or does Jesus not lie at all? Well, I think you and I both know Jesus doesn't lie, so there must be something more to this story. Now, let me show you how the Bible was written when it was originally put in English. There was no punctuation at the time. There was no spacing. It's actually a nightmare to read. This is what it looks like. Uh, and Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. That's Luke 23, verse 43. Now, look here. You add some spacing and punctuation, and it looks a lot easier to read. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, comma, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Now, what was Jesus telling to the thief? If he didn't go to heaven that day, he rested in the grave. He didn't go to heaven until Sunday. He told Mary, do not yet touch me, do not cling to me, I have not yet ascended to my Father. Maybe the issue is with how we're reading it today. See it again here. Jesus said to him, the thief on the cross, Verily I say unto thee, comma, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. But look what happens if you shift the comma over. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee today, comma, Thou sh shalt thou be with me in paradise. You get two completely different meanings there. Now, don't lose your mind over punctuation of the Bible. 99.99999% of the time, the translators got it right. right. The message is inspired. The punctuation is not inspired by God. We get the punctuation and word spacing and verses and everything. And that came after, uh, you know, many years down the road. Punctuation comes in to help us understand it easier, and sometimes it makes the difference if it's put in the wrong place. Here's what happened. This man on the cross was converted, and he said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says to him, I'm telling you today, I'm making you the promise today that when I come into my kingdom, you will be with me in paradise. He was giving him hope that at the return of Jesus, at the resurrection, he would indeed be able to go to heaven. Punctuation makes all the difference in the world. Actually, punctuation can kill, can't it? <laughs> Take a look at this cover of a magazine. Eat, Ray, love. Rachel Ray finds inspiration in cooking her family and her dog. Well, that sounds a bit morbid, doesn't it? But if you add some proper punctuation, it sounds a little less sadistic. <laughs> Rachel Ray finds inspiration in cooking, her family, and her dog. <laughs> Punctuation makes all the difference in the world. One of the things that the devil will use to manipulate the masses at the end time is spiritualism. Like Peachy, who has had an experience with spiritualism, we can learn a lot from how God has led her. Listen to Peachy's story now. I was possessed when I met Frank for three months. I was possessed by demon. I could not sleep at night because one of my girlfriends who was a Catholic, her name was Lily. 
she commits suicide. And my brother, two little young brother back then, told me when I went to, we live in Silver Spring, Dennis Avenue, and on Dennis Avenue, across from our house, is Colin's funeral home. She was right there. Her mom was right there. Now, Chinese people also don't believe in commit suicide because they think if you commit suicide, that means you have a family history of a mental problem, and that's a very not good thing. Okay, people will look you down on it. So she hesitated to tell everybody. But she called my mom that night, and I just happened to be there. At that time, I was married to my ex-husband. And so my mom said, I'm coming over. So I went with my mom to go over to viewing, to stay with the family, Lily. Well, when I came back, I have my daughter. She can barely talk, I remember now. She, uh, she can only say a boy or a girl or something else, very simple words. So she was very tiny then. Anyway, so we were going home in Takuma Park, and my two brothers say, number two sister, be careful. Lily might follow you home. And do you believe it? It gave that spirit. It wasn't Lily that came home with me. Something did come home with me. And that night, after I put my daughter in the, uh, her crib and went to sleep, I was in the kitchen with my ex-husband. And all of a sudden, I hear her screaming. And she screamed, she screamed. I ran in there, and I picked her up. I said, it's OK, it's OK. Go to sleep, go to sleep. She said, mommy, mommy. A boy, a boy, pointing that corner of my bedroom. That was it. I lost it. I was so scared. I couldn't sleep. So for three months and a half, I could not sleep at nighttime because I'm so afraid this ghost is, Lily is there back then. That's what I was thinking. This ghost, because Chinese people say when someone die, if they die of something that, um, like somebody killed them, you know, you, you need to prove yourself that you died of an innocence. She died of an innocence. So she probably have a lot of things she want to share with someone. So she will go find somebody and try to lead them to find that out or take a revenge or whatever you want to call it for them. That's all kind of talk that Chinese people do anyway. So I didn't know. I could not sleep. But when you cannot sleep, as we all know, you deprive of your health, your resting. Then your mind is open to all kind of things. And unfortunately, all kind of thing is nothing but spiritual, horrible, demon demonic things. And so I would be sitting there during the day trying to fight my sleep because I don't want to wait till nighttime. If I sleep during the day, I will not be able to sleep at night. So I did that, but I fall asleep and I can see myself. Initially, it's like my body is moving and the next thing you know, it goes faster, faster. And the next thing you know, it's almost like uh, I'm running around. Now you could say I'm hallucinating. I don't know what it is, but I know what I went through. It drove me crazy. But when I met Frank, all that changed. How? I don't know. Maybe God sent him to help me, you know? Because little by little, I was able to. And then when he led me to the church, that's when I find that out. It's amazing what happens when we simply allow God to lead. Peachy who by her words was demon possessed, manipulated by demons, experienced the, um, the presence of dead loved ones or what were uh, seemed to be dead loved ones. You know, when we trust in God and we recognize what the Bible says, 
The dead simply rest in the grave until the resurrection. If we got that, we're going to steal the devil's ability for manipulation. And I am happy about disarming the devil any chance that I can get. And we can do that by God's grace through his word. Do not end the series right here. We've got a few more presentations that are going to be just as powerful as this one. You don't want to miss any of them. And I'm looking forward to seeing you next time. Thank you and God bless.